I am hugely honored to welcome you to this, uh, this debate or this dialogue today as part of our collaboration with the National Sculptor Center. And, uh, and thank you so much uh, again for choosing us as partner in your international dialogues. It's really wonderful. I think uh, we have uh, brought together a very extraordinary panel. I won't say more about that, but I would love to introduce you to the director of the Nesha Sculptor Center, Jeremy Strick, who will introduce the panel. Please. Nana, thank you. Hello and welcome. Uh, we're delighted to be here in Copenhagen today uh, in generous partnership with CHART to bring you this discussion, Sculpture and Design. We, ex we extend our deep thanks to Nana Gortenberg and to all of her team, particularly Olivia Serio, Nana Rebecca, and Rebecca Chong for working with, with us so tirelessly to organize this afternoon's talk. I also want to extend a special thanks to the sponsors of this dialogue's talk, our friends from Dallas and great friends of the Nasher, Janelle and Alden Pinnell. Thank you, Janelle and Alden. Thank you for making this conversation possible. Before the discussion begins, uh, let me give you a bit of background on the Nasher Sculpture Center. The Nasher is a museum born from an extraordinary collection gathered by a Dallas couple, Patsy and Raymond Nasher, who spent decades seeking out exceptional modern and contemporary sculpture that they believed to have paved a way for ever more imaginative modes of the art form. The collection spans from the likes of Rodin to Calder to Magdalena Abakanovitz and Anish Kapoor. And in addition to highlighting works from the permanent collection, the Nasher Sculpture Center presents ambitious contemporary exhibition programming, including an upcoming show opening in just two weeks, Elm Green and Drag Set Sculptures. In the spirit of the Nasher's commitment to excellence and innovation in April 2015, the Nasher Prize was inaugurated, the most significant award in the world dedicated exclusively to contemporary sculpture. It is presented annually to a living artist who has had an extraordinary impact on the understanding of the art form. Each winner receives a $100,000 prize conferred in April of each year. The prize has so far honored artists Doris Salcedo, Pierre Huig, Theastra Gates, and Isa Genskin. We announced the 2020 Laureate this coming Wednesday, September 4th, so stay tuned. Complementing the Nasher Prize is a series of public programs called Nasher Prize Dialogues, of which this discussion today is a part. These panel discussions, lectures, and symposia made in partnership with other institutions around the world, such as the Reykjavik Art Museum, the Common Guild Glasgow, Museo Humex, Mexico City, and Academia der Kunst, Berlin, are intended to foster international awareness of sculpture and to stimulate discussion and debate. Held in cities where the practice of sculpture seems especially vital and conversations around sculpture are especially resonant, the dialogue series offers engagement with various audiences, providing myriad perspectives and insight into the ever-expanding field of sculpture. Here in Copenhagen, one of the design capitals of the world, surrounded by newly commissioned architectural projects in the courtyard by some of the best and brightest young artists and designers, amidst this remarkably intelligent and human-scaled fair, the talk will aptly be called Sculpture Plus Design and will consider the role of design and architecture within the artistic practices of Nina Bayer, Martin Boyce, and Michael Elmgreen of Elmgreen and Dragset. Each of these artists deploys the trappings of design and architecture within their sculpture in wonderfully rigorous visual puzzles, and we look forward to hearing from them about their thinking and processes. Guiding the conversation this afternoon will be National Prize juror, art historian and critic, Bryony Fair. Bryony is professor of art history at University College London, and she has written extensively on diverse topics of 20th century and contemporary art, and on contemporary artists such as Gabriel Orozco, V.S. Elmans, Jean-Luc Moulin, 
Ronnie Horn, Ed Ruscha, and Rachel Whiteread. Her books include Gabriel Orozco, Thinking in Circles, Eva Hess, Studio Work, The Infinite Line, Remaking Art After Modernism, and On Abstract Art. As a member of our Nasher Prize jury for two years, Bryony's voice has enriched the conversation in the Liberation Room, bringing a remarkable array of insight into the work of our greatest living artists. We are very grateful to Bryony for coming to be with us here in Copenhagen and for her thoughtfulness that she has committed to this discussion between these three outstanding artists. Bryony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you to Chart. Thank you to the NASHA. I'm delighted to be able to, to chair this afternoon's conversation between these three artists whose work I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, Martin Boyce, Nina Bayer, and Michael Elmgreen of Elmgreen and Dragset. I don't want to spend more time than is strictly necessary just opening that discussion because we haven't got long and I think there's a great deal to say. Um, we're in some ways expanding the notion of design to touch on architecture, but in a way I think all of us might feel there's a problem with you know, the idea that art or sculpture might be about architecture, you know, that or about design. And in some ways, I think part of our conversation might be about what does it mean to work with those kinds of cultural materials? You know, are you as artists working with architecture design as a as raw material, as a cultural material, as a literal, palpable, you know, material like any other? You know, what is it that you're doing with it? Um, I think it's very interesting to bring you three together because the three practices, in some ways, um, one can imagine certain overlaps perhaps, but they're so distinctive. And I think one of the things that we'd really like to do is both try to touch on the problem, but also loosen up the categories sculpture, of course, to think of that in a more expanded sense, but also to think, you know, what might go under the sign of architecture and design, um, so that we might actually get into something more substantive, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> circus act. Um, <laughs> about your practices. So we do have some images that we're going to be fairly casually rolling through and perhaps pausing over. Um, but first of all, I'd like to just ask each of you, um, even if we, we complicate this later, what it means for you if one's going to say, you know, you work with architecture. Uh, Michael, can I start with you? Is that a meaningful or a, or a meaningless uh, question. I mean, uh, as an artist, you can't imagine uh, not being depending on space. You need to have a place to show your work. And of course, space influences the way the audience perceive your work, the setting, the social context, uh, the geographical location and the aesthetics of the architecture that surrounds you. We started out with a practice because we didn't have any proper art education. So we started out with a practice that were questioning the format of the white cube, for instance, a, a standardized mm. uh, format of uh, showing art, um, because it looks more or less the same all over the world. Even McDonald's look different, but art spaces look very much alike. Um, so we started questioning that until we found out that uh, the art spaces are not going to change just because we question them. Maybe we should change the art space now and then. So mm -hmm. I would say we put architecture on a survival course sometimes to see if it can survive our interpretation and our handling of it, and if it can get a new kind of identity or consciousness through how we treat it. Hmm. Nina, 
Well, it's funny. I, I, I wouldn't have um, consciously thought about architecture in, in a direct way to my practice, but I do think that I guess all people who make sculpture rely on the language that has been produced within design and architecture and sculpture as well. But because we work in this, in this field, we have the choice of either uh, representing these existing uh, tropes that exist out there or borrowing from them. And it's mm -hmm. a constant negotiation of bringing these, these things in dialogue because that is the language we work with. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, it can, be, it can be fruitful to think about it as, as that, as a language that is shared between mm -hmm. the fields. Martin? Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes when you're, these associations are made, you, you, you instantly kind of want to resist them. And, and that, as your practice develops, you become less conscious about what it is that you're looking at. You know, so there may have been a time when it was clear that I, I, was, I was really drawn towards a certain language of uh, the history of design and, uh, and architecture. But as the, as the practice kind of develops, it, it includes so many things. And I think really I'm, you know, I'm very interested in constructed landscape and also interiors and the psychology of interiors. And, and how in a, through an arrangement of objects or through an arrangement of sculptural fragments, you can build you can create a cityscape or you can create uh, an archetypal mm. space like a, an urban park uh, or a, a, a corporate lobby space through the introduction of specific objects or, or specific types of objects. And, and I think that's where sculpture and space and architecture kind of collapse together in my practice. Mm. I mean, in some ways, there have been moments in history, I mean, as an under art historian, forgive me for a moment, but I mean, moments in 20th century art and architectural history where things must have felt much more certain, you know, a kind of that desire for unity that was the Bauhaus, you know, this, this desire for a utopian uh, totality that modernity or modern life could in some ways bring these different elements together. I mean, in some ways there, there perhaps isn't the possibility even of a a kind of, you know, late 1950s, the independent group, Raina Bannum, that kind of thinking about art and architecture or art and design now. But something has perhaps come out of that, and that's the idea that it was all a bit of a fiction, that, that imaginary, the mise-en-scene of the Bauhaus rather than, you know, pure form following function was as staged as anything else you know and I in some ways all your practices do speak to those sorts of fictional environments I, I think we very much uh, question certain tendencies in uh, modernist architecture and design I mean Bauhaus had uh, an amazing utopian vision of mass producing uh, furniture in materials that at that time were cheap leather and chrome and steel and uh, so on. And what happened to it? Well, the Bauhaus furniture are luxury goods today and not for the big working class masses. Um, the housing is also uh, very hard to live in, but very attractive for connoisseurs uh, to own. And uh, the idea of architecture at that time was we know what the people need. Like as we would have completely standardized needs in our everyday lives and routines. And fortunately, we have come to a certain point in our uh, culture where we have to admit that um, we are quite diverse. Mm. We live in different ways, mm. with different desires. We have different dreams, we have different backgrounds, and therefore such standardized models are very difficult uh, to work with in today's mm. reality. And that's maybe where we come in and sometimes uh, either mock or question or um, 
displace or alienate uh, some of these uh, truths mm -hmm. of modernist design uh, and say, hey, what if? Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking perhaps, Nina, about some of your, I'm going to just be running through some of the images, but if we can think for a moment in that context about the, I mean, perhaps yours is the practice that references architecture the least explicitly, but certainly the idea of a thing world that we inhabit, you know, a world of things, a world of props, I think we were talking about earlier, whether you can just talk us a little, talk us through a little bit, some of these images. It actually occurred to me now that you were talking about the fictions, that maybe this, there is a picture in an apartment, um, because I staged, I staged exhibitions in, um, in show homes uh, over a couple of years, and I would, um, I would convince real estate developers to, to house my exhibition in these, these artificial homes that are made just to sell the apartments. And this one was in Mexico and the building had not even been built yet. So there was just a concrete structure there. Um, and you would walk through the splatter and the banging noises and open a door and there would be this little perfect artificial mm. image of a home. Um, so I installed, I had both performative pieces there. The dog is playing dead. Um, and, and then also replacing this because there are these um, Ikea type artworks that are used for these uh, contexts normally. So, so the placeholders were there and I just exchanged and put the works in the places where um, that had already been designated as, as artwork spots in the, in the home. Um, and I thought that that was, I, it didn't occur mm. to me when we spoke before, but somehow yeah, I think it's the most direct yeah. experiment I've done into like the idea of, oh. of this, like the staged. Um, but the, the lion, yeah. um, perhaps say something about that, because this conjunction yeah, um, of, the, of the lion in the... So these, so I worked with these guardian lions and I got interested in them because... Um, of, of basically the history of, of the guardian lion as a, as a motif is, is like basically no one knows where it originated because it developed over like basically glo globally. There are versions of marble lions, guardian lions around everywhere. Um, and they just, they slowly changed over time. Now, most of them are produced in China, but still in the different styles of the different regions. Um, and, and I like these objects because they are these like guardians of the threshold between architecture or the building and the outside, the private space or the public space or, um, and, and when we were talking about this, like the, the meeting of architecture, design and art, for me, this has been the, the object that has posed like the most interesting uh, tension of that field to me because when, I, when they arrived at my studio, they were placed outside in the back garden next to the trash bins and they looked fantastic there and they created this threshold. They, they brought the architecture with them when they were standing there, when they were picked up and brought on the van to the exhibition space. They looked amazing standing on the van, in the elevator, every, every stage along the way, I was, I was uh, amazed at their ability to carry like, this, this power of the, the role that they had uh, initially, uh, were initially made for. And then the moment they, they made it into the exhibition space, they were just marble sculptures. And, I've, and I couldn't bring out that, that power of, of mm. yeah, the, or I struggled to, to uh, identify that. Mm. And now I've, I've just installed them in the um, outer spaces of Kunsthallegent. So they're in the stairwell and the toilet and the kitchen. So now they've found like this in-between space where they somehow mm. hold on to their... Mm. But I think the idea of a threshold that is not something fixed but mobile mm -hmm. and is actually a, a, a psychosocial threshold as much as a literal um, built... Um, boundary between spaces. I mean, Martin, would you say that your um, 
in some ways you're also using the space of an installation. Um, you're not referencing the built environment necessarily in an explicit way or design objects necessarily. But how would you imagine yourself in, are you using certain references as material, would you say, or is that too literal? I, I think it, it, it kind of comes and goes. Uh, I, I, there's been times when there's been very specific objects have uh, are referenced and, and the history and the, the sort of social and cultural history of those objects feeds into the work and, and, and kind of can be, you know, kind of unpacked in a way. And then there's other works that become much more open and less specific and and really function in a more poetic mm. kind of way and more dealing with and it's something I guess over a period of time I've become more comfortable with mm. you're trying to deal with objects and atmospheres things mm. like that. Is but this it, the Jean Montel that's the Mallet Stevens Garden of yeah, the, the yeah yeah so. So some years ago, in fact, it was around 2005, I was living in Berlin for a short period and I had this a bit of time on my hands where I could really sort of develop this project. And some years earlier than that, I had come across this image of these four abstract concrete trees, which were made by the sculptor brothers, Jan and Joel Martel. And, and I just became really fascinated with this structure and and you know, there's a, I, I began to take apart the tree and, and, and I developed a repeat pattern based on the tree. Mm -hmm. I developed a typography that came out of the repeat pattern and, and really not so rigidly now, but still to this day, I have a palette of shapes that come from the original trees that I still, look, uh, I still use within the sculptural mm -hmm. language of the work. Uh, and, oh, sorry, yes, the, 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 the previous image of the the hanging chandelier. Mm -hmm. uh, this was from a, an installation in Venice. And in the original <coughs> Palazzo, uh, when we went to visit it for the first time, there's these really gaudy Murano glass chandeliers oh. hanging from the ceiling. And on the plane back from seeing the space that I decided I, I would show in, two things occurred to me. I wanted to, I wanted to replace the Murano glass chandeliers with a sculptural equivalent with my chandelier. And I wanted to introduce autumn leaves into the rooms. And that was my instinct, was to somehow, mm. somehow kind of wedge one landscape into another. So to, to sort of bring this idea of a garden into an interior. Mm. And so when I went back to the studio, I had to figure out what the chandelier would be. And I took this model of the, uh, the Martel tree that I had made and I just inverted it. Mm. Uh, so, and, and, and here uh, on these pieces, you can see the repeat pattern that was developed from the trees. And I think this piece, this is a ventilation grill piece. Uh, th there's been many different iterations of, of the ventilation grill sculptures, but, but they, for me, I mean, they're, they're among the smallest works that I've made physically. But of course, when you install, say, five ventilation grills throughout a series of rooms or even in one room, then the whole architecture of the space becomes the work, becomes part of the work. And this is really interesting. I think you're talking about the idea of thresholds uh, in relation to sculpture, in relation to art and installation, because these pieces really mark that. They, they became these thresholds between the interior spaces that we occupy in a building and mm. the unseen guts of a building, mm. the conduits and mm. pipes and so on, that, we, that we're not party mm. to in, in architecture, but are kind of going on around us. I mean, in a way, if we can come back to some of these, but perhaps if we can jump forward, Michael, to, to some of your work where you dramatize some of these differences between inside and outside, or you work in both, you work with interiors and you make works that are outside. And I wondered if you could say something about your interest in interiors and... Uh, I mean, in, interior design has had quite a bad reputation. It, it, it's kind of, if, if people introduce themselves as interior designer, it's almost like you're a hairdresser or something like that. If you ask architects where architecture is, they're conceptual masters. The reality in our world today is that very few of us can actually afford to have an architect making our space. So we have to express our identities and organize our lives on the inside. And therefore, I think 
interior is a much more interesting cultural signifier than architecture is because architecture is just the result of maybe a pretentious architect making his landmark in the middle of the city, whereas how we decorate our homes tell about our times today, our uh, identities, our ways of living. Uh, and um, when we were invited to do uh, a uh, pavilion in uh, Venice. Actually, we were invited to do two, two pavilions because Inga is Norwegian and I'm Danish and they got the idea at the same time, the same years, and they are also neighbors. So we were invited to do two pavilions and we thought of these houses as domestic houses because they have somehow um, the scale of a bourgeois villa. Mm -hmm. like or an, an embassy in a posh neighborhood. And in Venice, you also have this situation where you have a national representation, everyone are competing about getting uh, the prize, like winning the prize for growing the biggest pumpkin in your garden in a smaller village or something like that. So we thought, let's make these into real domestic settings mm -hmm. of uh, collectors, because in private collections, the interior, the design of the house, uh, is playing quite a significant role. I mean, uh, the house might be shaped after the collection, the collection might also be shaped after uh, um, how the house and the uh, architectural settings are. And we wanted to highlight the fact that people actually collect because of all kind of weird, insane reasons, and not only as investment or market prices, mm -hmm. but like that's always what is in the media, what is selling mm -hmm. for the biggest price, but they forget that people also collect because of all weird kind of passions and beliefs. So we made these two houses of, uh, of uh, collectors in, in Venice, and also to give people a possibility to see artworks in a different setting. Sometimes if you come to an exhibition and you are in a typical white cube, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is it a good artwork? Or is it art at all? And that's so not interesting. I mean, it's interesting what the artwork is telling you. What kind of message is it giving you? What is it doing to you? And that, I think you are much more able to get as an immediate experience if you change the environment, if you in, erase the inst institutional framing and turn it into something else, because then suddenly you look at the art world in a way where you feel, oh, I can also sit down on the sofa or sit at the desk and shoulders down, you look at the art world in a more personal way and not in such a hierarchic viewer situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was struck that when you were talking, Nina, the, I think the word in French for a show home is a maison témoin, a kind of a witness home always has a kind of criminal air to it and in some ways um, well certainly in in your in in a work like this Michael or or elsewhere where you've even scripted I think the kind of the fictional life of your protagonists and and I think both Martin and Nina you also imagine a I mean, a viewer is also a protagonist that enters into your your scene, as it were. And I wonder how you would see the the viewer entering into some of your installations. And Martin, perhaps particularly in relation to that Eames work that you, um, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes, where you're invoking Eames just as in the last piece we were looking at, you know, you have this kind of, these precious modernist design objects interspersed with sculptures and other other things that we live with and what that whether you would could describe what you're doing with that eames yeah, I, connotation 
I, I became really fascinated by the Eames storage units, these modular shelving systems, uh, and also they mirror the Eames house itself. They, 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 they both came about around the same time. Um, and of course, they seem to represent in such a very concise way th this idea of the, the transparency and democracy of the modernist project. But the, the more I began to look at them and think about them in relation to the present or the present that I made them within, the, the Los Angeles that they now might occupy in a sort of fictional sense wasn't the Los Angeles that they were born into. And, and I was really interested in this more kind of paranoid, uh, you know, dystopic kind of landscape that they might now be part of. And so I began to imagine this sort of parallel noir sort of landscape mm. that they might occupy. And so in, in this case, for example, the, you know, the primary colored panels that create the, the shelving spaces, they, they were originally, uh, so the, the sculpture is completely remade. It's not a off the shelf Eames unit. Mm. It's made from similar materials, but then in a sense, I sort of dusted the object in darkness. I mm -hmm. wanted to kind of to see an object under bright light, but for it to look like it was in the dark and, uh, and then sit it underneath this huge, mm -hmm. you know, you could almost hear the light, you know, this, all these strip lights, it's really uncomfortable kind of presence. And the idea of using these off the shelf mm -hmm. uh, fluorescent lights to then to draw with and create mm -hmm. the spider's web. So it was really a, this idea of, of introducing a, this sort of noir landscape, mm. uh, this sort of imaginary kind of parallel world. I mean, Nina, in, in your work, it seems that you're not using, um, you're not making the elements. It's, it seems important to you that you're using ready-made um, objects. Yes. Uh, is, there, is that relevant here? Is that... I think in what does that mean to, to your practice? To the viewer, there might be um, there is a connection between the the way that the viewer walks in to a space carrying their own stories and their own problems and their own perspectives, and they meet these objects that come with a similarly loaded mm. um, history, and I and I like to to get to this point. I, I think. In a strange way, I think I, I, I strive for the fiction that you guys achieve by making the ghosts of the objects somehow. But, but, but I rely a lot on, on the fact that these are guilty objects and they're mm. there with all their, mm. all their shit. And I think maybe there's, there's the tonnet chair I was just thinking when you were talking about the shelving unit. But uh, these, these mm. Viennese cafe chairs that were um, the tonic, the company that produced them uh, patented the bending of wood in voluptuous shapes. They're the first ones to to do this to wood. And the flaw in the, the design of these chairs is that the vicar part always breaks when you sit on it. Um, and, and somehow this chair is such an iconic story of the, the European cafe culture and mm. the, how on a global scale that plays into like how things have moved around mm. the world. And I paired them with these um, coco de mer, which are these coconuts that, are sh that look like a uh, female bottom. Um, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but I like like the space between if, if a palm tree mm. makes a female nude and a designer makes like mm. a voluptuous, mm. uh, structure and like the meeting of the two in the shape of a sculpture. There's something mm. about this. Um, well, there's something about a chair as well. It is almost the, the mold or the, the body is a mold and the chair is a cast. You yeah, know, it's yeah. almost a negative. But that idea of fiction, perhaps we could take up a little bit more in relation to this idea of fiction that we've been talking about, which seems important how loaded, how psychically charged and, and thinking about some of the power relations that you've been bringing up in some ways, the, the politics of the ordinary or of that which we live in, you know. Um, and I was thinking in some respects of, of, of this work, which is 2004, 
five, I think. Right. Um, but it's rather different. We've been talking more about interiors, and this, on the other hand, is a... And know, the, has... the, the interior is very um, um, important for it, because these mint green shelvings are, of course, a symbol of how the uh, commercial fashion industry has profited from uh, uh, art and minimalism, and uh, uh, how minimalism almost at some point around the millennium became quite kitsch. Mm. It was like uh, if if you would go and have an expensive cocktail, the, the lounge would be completely white and minimal, and then you would be sure that it would be an expensive cocktail uh, that you would have at that place. Um, um, Prada Martha is placed very close to the Judd Foundation. And of course, the shelving of Prada has uh, bought quite a lot from uh, Judd's furniture designs and later on uh, minimal furniture design and, uh, aesthetics. So is there a question about whether this is a symbiotic relation or a parasitic? One in some ways there seems something parasitic, and maybe this could be this could be two way in some ways. I wouldn't call it a parasite because then you accept that there is like a main organism and you are just a little intruder. Um, I would say we 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 are all more of uh, UFOs that land in the familiar and is alienating the surroundings and what has turned into conventions and where we don't see the surroundings any longer. And suddenly these stupid artists place an object that is alienating the context so much that we suddenly start to think about it again. And like the, the, the desert certainly looks different as a backdrop from for Prada Martha uh, than if you go two kilometers away and you don't see any Prada Martha and you have a different interpretation of nature. Um, and then I don't think it, it matters if it's a real estate showroom or if it's a, a, a Venetian palace where you uh, insert like a, a a modernism in a different kind of way. It's very often about displacement in, in order to actually see the true character of the surrounding and where the, um, you as a viewer is situated. And in that way, you can get some kind of consciousness about mm. you, you are here and now. The beautiful thing about sculptural <coughs> practice and architecture is that there's still the physical providers of us getting together in times where mm. we occupy so much of our time on the internet and don't meet in a physical mm. way. Do you think that problem of displacement, I mean, one could see that as something that you use, a really important technique that you all use or device or operation, um, but it's also kind of fundamental as a sculptural Technique, yes. I mean, as much as the material of sculpture, the you know within twentieth century sculpture, rather than referring back to traditions beforehand. I mean, displacement seems kind of fundamental, whether or not you use a ready-made element or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking about displacement in relation to your work, Nina. I mean, do you think that would be something? Yeah, I think that I think that's basically what I do where whenever I bring a Chinese vase into the art space or like mm. I borrowed a lot of the domestic kind of tropes for to, mm. to construct sculptures. But um, I think maybe as an example, the, the equestrian statues on horses, there was an interesting case of this because then I was invited to do a public sculpture and I, I struggle to to um, locate the the right language for mm -hmm. doing this gesture, and somehow realized that I had to to try to work with the trope that's already there, the one that belongs outside mm 
-hmm. And uh, it happens that there's a lot of men on horses in bronze out there. Mm. And I proposed to collect um, all the the equestrian statues I could get my hands on. And they're they're Mm. placed out um, in the waves on the Belgian coast. So they appear and, and disappear in the tide. But the thing was that the statues I could find were, there was a knight and a jockey and a, a polo player and some, some sort of Roman warrior. Um, so it became this strange little group that mm. in itself became the displacement, uh, even though the, um, mm. the statues were weirdly at home mm. in the context. I mean, it strikes me looking at they couldn't look more different, but in one sense, the way in which you're using equestrian sculptures or the slightly comical sometimes, the lions as thresholds, but I mean, often they're, they could be symbols of power or they, they could be kind of leftovers from a certain kind of discursive language of power. And in some ways, modernism or modernist architectures or certain forms of modernist architectures, of course, are, are just as ridden by you know, regulatory powers of, of how to organize our, our movement in space, or um, there's something that one could or has been seen as coercive in some forms of, of, of modernist architecture, even despite its utopian imaginary that it's so longed for. Um, but it seems interesting in all the work in, in that fine line between these perhaps regulatory patterns or you know form sets in some ways um sometimes drawn from modernist architecture design sometimes not sometimes from minimalism and the other what you're countering that with what other kinds of movement because it is about displacement but it's also something about how you move in the in the places that you you make, Martin, can you say something? Yeah, I mean, maybe about your arrangements in a way of how you. Well, maybe the the sort of tennis court piece at the very end mm. is is the most recent work. It's still actually on view at the moment, and it's it's a piece that I just made. I think it opened around May, and it's it's on the I the, uh, the Scottish island of Butte. Uh, and it's in the gardens of a, a very, very grand house called Mount Stewart. So it's in this; it's already in this controlled landscape, uh, this expansive garden. And there was something about a conversation that I had that introduced this idea that there had been a tennis court in the grounds at some point in the 70s or 80s, but no one could quite mm. remember quite where it was. And so this idea of this sort of phantom landscape reappearing sort of became interesting to me. But then also this collapse of exterior and interior. And so the, so the tennis court is defined by the chain link fence. Uh, although the, the, the floor surface and the, and the chain link fence have somehow become dislodged from each other and one is drifting away. So there's this sort of um, fragmentary kind of dislocated sort of atmosphere that begins to happen. There's these uh, tall lighting posts with these sort of lanterns hanging from them. And, so th- and also there's two gates, so there's a threshold. So you're in the garden and then you come across this place mm-hmm. and you have the option to kind of pass into this, you know, over this threshold and into this other space. So it's a garden within a garden. But then within the, w- within, within the, the sort of notional tennis court itself uh, is a concrete fireplace which could also be read as the proscenium arch from a theater but in this case the theater set has outgrown the proscenium arch uh, the, there's a table frame some table legs but the, the circular tabletop has now been suspended on a wire and becomes this moon or sun or something so so this idea of a of a of a landscape that could be some kind of stage set but that's it, also appears to be just forgotten and, and that you're stumbling across this other time. Uh, mm. So you have this strange kind of um, dislocation and you're not certain what time frame even that you're stepping into uh, mm. when, you, when, you, when you pass into it. But also the, this idea of transparency with the chain link fence, 
somehow relates to the, the sort of modernist villa in, 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 in the landscape, you know, the Farnsworth house, for example, uh, this, this glass kind of transparency that, that, that became such an important part of this sort of modernist language. And so this is, yeah, this idea of, of architecture and landscape is quite well kind of represented, I think, in that piece. Is that a lamppost as in street furniture that you would have in a, a street? Not really. It's, it's a, I mean, for me, it was just to make, rather than these floodlights, it was, hmm. and to use these lanterns, it was rather than, than strictly tie it to the language of the tennis court, of course, the tennis court, if you want to play at night, you need some kind of illumination, mm. but uh, it was to, to also play around with, you know, a form mm. of, of, of mm. lantern that could be from the street, could be from the domestic, could be for the exterior, mm. just to kind of blur those sort mm. of uh, definitions. I mean, it invokes in some ways the idea at the risk of making too forced a connection with the notion of a swimming pool or some space that's very demarcated, you know, in the case of a swimming pool, concrete, or, you know, it has these elements, but obviously in some ways there's an expectation of freedom or a way the body moves with the reference perhaps to a Hockney swimming pool or some of the, you know, elements of, of uh, fluidity or moving through water and then the way in which you're using this space of leisure within your mise-en-scene. I wondered whether it seems to also touch on those more. Yeah, we have both made uh, um, happier swimming pools and, and also quite sad swimming pools. The uh, saddest swimming pool we made recently in Whitechapel, where we made like a public pool that had been mm. abandoned due to gentrification in mm. the area. And, uh, Actually, even people who were regular goers to the, the Whitechapel Gallery couldn't really uh, uh, find out where they ended up in the building because we really transformed the space completely. Um, but, I mean, the swimming pool is a good reminder of, uh, to us in the art world that there are different ways to uh, interact in a physical way. I mean, there are people who meet without having a glass of bubbles at an opening, but they actually meet in a public pool or by a tennis court or on a football mm. field or uh, in, in other uh, settings. And uh, these physical interactions are becoming uh, more and more important in our reality of today mm. where we hide ourselves uh, at home mm. behind our iPhones or our laptops. Mm. Um, but um, I mean, the, the, the pool is a symbol of, of many things. In, 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 in Britain, it is, it was a, the public pool was highly important because it's quite a prude society where you uh, mostly see each other fully dressed. And it was a way of uh, uh, teaching the children that there are other bodies, even other sexes, uh, uh, within the population, and they could see each other in swimsuits uh, at the public pool. Mm. And that's uh, mm. important for mm. British culture, mm. I think. Otherwise, mm. it would be even worse mm. today. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> even worse? How, could, how could that be? How? <laughs> But sense that I, yeah, sense of um, a social aspect and, and spaces of social interaction that are increasingly privatized, or there's something larger as well that's going on here, isn't there? In, in terms of the way the work perhaps touches or dramatizes these points where the public or something shared or these spaces of collectivity. Are, are being um, extracted from that public realm? Or do you see that as something that is the concern of sculpture? Or one reason why architecture or these kinds of questions, why architecture might produce a, a useful kind of repository of, of materials for you to work with? 
I think doing a public sculpture is amazing because you uh, interact with a different kind of audience, wider and wilder. Uh, mm. um, and you often find out that people are actually engaged in their public space when it comes to a public sculpture because they get really pissed off if the wrong <laughs> proposal is chosen and they get very <laughs> upset and uh, uh, start a debate mm. about it, which is very healthy mm. because I think many feel estranged from public space today. Mm. We have been so afraid of what can happen in public space of not orderly uh, uh, events that we have made so many rules and regulations within public space that people don't feel it belongs to them anymore. Mm. I mean, also here in Scandinavia where everything is so minimal, I mean, like there have to be 10 designers to do like an ashtray or like a garbage <laughs> bin on a, on a public square and everything has to be in a certain order. Or health and safety re uh, regulations, I used to call them health and safety regulations in, 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 in London where you think that you can make a rule for every step around in the city, this illusion of you can control mm. every kind of behavior in, mm. uh, in, within the city. And then you have an artwork coming up and people start to engage and people start to have an opinion about, do we want that? We're part of owning this public space and we don't like it or we like it and therefore it. I think the four splints in, in, in Trafalgar Square is such a successful uh, uh, project because you have these temporary art uh, uh, installations there and everyone, even the cab drivers, know about them and have an opinion about them. They might think it's rubbish, but they think something about it. Hmm. Well, I'm glad we can have a view about something <laughs> and make our minds up. but. Perhaps at, at that point with thinking about people's views about things in the last few minutes, we might just open up the discussion and see whether you have any questions that you'd like to put to the artists here. It's incredibly hot. We do realize that you're <laughs> everybody's melting in this room. Are there any thoughts or responses? Yes. Uh, my name is Angelica Dahl. I made an interview this morning with the Danish architect Jan Guy, who's been very, and you're probably familiar with him, he's been very interested in the public space and how you can make room for social interaction. And he talked this morning about uh, contemporary work, sculptures, that were curated maybe for three months or six months, like the fourth big project in London. So what would you think about the three of you of participating in works of art or public sculptures like that? Where it's not sort of something which had to be there for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years, but in a more short, yeah, I, th I think as an artist, you know, how you engage with any situation, but let's take that example. I mean, I think it's just a, it's a specific context and each context is, is specific. Um, and I think understanding that situation then allows you to think in a different way about an artwork. And uh, over the last maybe five, six, seven years, I, I've been working more uh, in, I, in whether public, the public realm is right, but it, certainly in outdoor situations or in, in the city and, and so on. And uh, it's a, comp uh, it's, I found it really like, it's almost like a different job altogether. It's, it's and, and on so many levels because on one hand, the, the gallery or the institution creates this very safe framework for the work and for a kind of critical discussion and, and it kind of absorbs those things usually. I mean, there's, there's definitely, you know, uh, Elm Green Drags that have made, you know, real inroads into that, uh, you know, critique of those kind of systems. 
But the, once you go, once you step outdoors, it's like all bets are off. And, and it's, you're dealing with a completely different audience, but you're dealing with just the elements, you know? So to make, so to make a work that lasts for three months, that's, that's quite a, that's a much nicer kind of proposition or easier proposition than to make something that's going to last for 20 years, you know? So your whole possibility of materials is a, is a different one, you know? So, so making work for the, the public realm, I mean, it, yeah, after working on a few projects, I realized why there's so many bronze sculptures in plazas, <laughs> because as a material, it doesn't go anywhere, you know? And so I, I made a, a huge chain of uh, lanterns that hung down an alleyway in Vancouver. And that was just, logistically, it was a nightmare. You know, it, it took about four years uh, from beginning to end to, to find a way to do it. And yeah, so, so to have a, a more compressed time frame or, or something, then that, that introduces a bit more flexibility and, and, and openness, which is yeah, sometimes useful. I think, I think I used to be a bigger fan of things that were not permanent than I is, I, I am today. Because I think we live in a world that is so disposal in many ways that everything has to be hip and hot for three months. And then we go on to something else. There's also something beautiful about placing something permanent and it becomes part of the urban DNA. It becomes a navigation point for locals that let's meet by blah, blah, blah. Um, and you will have to commit in a different way. It's not so promiscuous. It's like a lifelong marriage in a very traditional way. And I think we need that. I also think it's important to keep certain dynamics within our urban structures, but I think we have been overly focused on that in, in recent years. Things have to change. Things have to be not meant for real. And I think in, in these times, it's maybe important that we sign up for some permanent values. Then again, there's always like those materials that don't fit in anywhere. I feel like every time I've done an institutional show, there's three works that have to be canceled because of the fear of rodents or like, what do you do with that popcorn idea that you had? And then sometimes that invitation to do something in a like, yeah, toilet of the public, uh, I don't know, that becomes the perfect place to do the, the popcorn project. So. It's, it's also, when we're talking about architecture as restriction, there's the, the art institutions usually pose like quite a restrictive mm. um, framework. And it's, it's nice when there's a chance to, uh, to do something that works with duration and no, no, duration definitely. that's not... Uh, mm. I mean, it's not one or the other, but like no. we, we, we have a permanent sculpture where like he, it used to be every day, but now he's there once a week. We have a guy mm -hmm. uh, taking out a, a stainless steel bullhorn megaphone from a glass cabinet, and then he shouts out to the public at 12 o'clock, uh, it's never too late to say sorry. And the city signed up for having that guy on the payroll for now four years. So he got a job out of it, which is beautiful. Yeah, and was it was actually it was actually possible. Yeah, it was also in Aspen for, for a while, but it is uh, permanent in, in Rotterdam. And by hearing the announcement of it's never too late to say, sorry, people know it's 12 o'clock. Well, I think... We're at a um, point when we, there is no more time. And so thank you very much to all three of you for, for, for your thoughts. And thank you all for bearing with the heat and with us. So thank you.